What's going on, guys? It's the hottest crypto podcast here on YouTube. Crypto's dumping, crypto's crashing. If you're scared right now, you deserve to be out of the market. If you're scared right now, th this isn't for you. I love chaos. I thrive in these chaotic environments when the market's dumping. That being said, though, this dump is like nothing I've seen before. I'm gonna be real. Here we go. Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is David Rhodes and I am the editor in chief of Current Affairs magazine. As a headline in the New York Times, this week cryptocurrencies melt down in a perfect storm of fear and panic. A steep sell-off that gained momentum this week starkly illustrated the risks of the experimental and unregulated digital currencies. Current Affairs has written about cryptocurrencies before, and we count ourselves as skeptics. Uh, someone else who counts himself as a skeptic is Nicholas Weaver, our guest today. He is a senior staff researcher focusing on computer security at the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, California, and he has also served as a lecturer in the computer science department at UC Berkeley. Professor Weaver, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. So you have a, on YouTube, you have a lecture about cryptocurrencies that I watched, uh, and you take a pretty strong stand against them. This is a quote from you from 2018 where you said, cryptocurrencies are an interesting idea, but not simply not fit for purpose. They do not work as currencies. They're grossly inefficient. They're not meaningfully distributed in terms of trust. Uh, they have risks to participants, technical risks, economic risks, systemic risks uh, to the cryptocurrency ecosystem and societal risks. In your 2022 lecture, you're, you're a little more blunt. <laughs> you say, this is a virus. Its harms are substantial. It's enabled a billion dollar criminal enterprises. It's enabled venture capitalists to do securities fraud as a business and it sucked people in. So either avoid it or help me make it die in a fire. Yeah. So let's, <laughs> maybe we should start though with what you think the best way for the average person to begin to think about what a cryptocurrency is, is. Well, I'd start with what it's supposed to be in theory. So in theory, it's supposed to be a way of doing payments with no intermediary. So the idea is if Alice wants to pay Bob a bet for 200 Quatloos on the green thrall, um, Alice should be able to transfer... Quatloo being an imaginary drink. currency. Can I just say... <laughs> you, you've dropped a word that isn't a real word, so I do want to explain it. <laughs> it's actually specifically a Star Trek reference. Oh, um, okay. 400 Quatloos against the newcomers. 200 Quatloos against. Wait, wait, hear me. We can't wager for trifles like what? So if you want to gamble with your imaginary currency, there should be no intermediary that is responsible for executing the transfer. It's just direct peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, is how do you know who has what balance? Electronic cash is actually something we've had for decades now. If right. I want to transfer you money, I use PayPal or sure. M-Pesa or Visa or a wire transfer or this or that. Those all have a central intermediary. Mm -hmm. And there's a disadvantage of central intermediaries. They don't like drug dealers. <laughs> True. So as a money transmitter, you are under legal obligations to block a lot of known bad activity. Sure. So the cryptocurrency, the idea is let's eliminate the notion of the intermediary by making our balances public but pseudonymous. So you're no longer you. You are just some long sequence of random looking numbers. Mm. And so let's create a ledger in the town square so everybody's bank balance is public in the town square but only identified by the pseudonyms the anonymous things 
And so Alice, to pay off her, her wager, writes a check. I, Alice's random pseudonymity, pay Bob, Alice's random, or Bob's random pseudonymity, 200 quatlus, signed mm. Alice, random mm. pseudonymity. Bob takes that check, checks to make sure that Alice indeed has a balance. Yeah. And if so, post that check to the public ledger, and now everybody knows Alice is down 200, Bob right. is up 200. And that's how it works. Okay. The, the problem is, is how do you keep somebody from adding to the ledger? Okay. Well, that is where the notion of a the mining comes in. Okay. So what the miners are doing is literally wasting tons of electricity to prove that the record is intact because anybody who would want to attack it has to waste that similar ton of electricity. The energy intensiveness comes from the fact that solving these mathematical puzzles is challenging and putting as much computational energy into that challenge as possible increases your ability to actually win. It's intentionally inefficient. This creates a couple of real imbalances. Either they're insecure or they're inefficient. That if you don't waste a lot of energy, see. someone can rewrite history cheaply. If you don't want people to rewrite history, you have to be wasting tons and tons of resources 24-7, 365. And that's why Bitcoin burns as much power as a significant country. So, so, and, and so it is correct. The criticism that you hear of Bitcoin, you know, it uses the energy of a, a small to medium-sized country that that is true, right? And you 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 point out in in your lecture that there are a number of ways that the enthusiasts of Bitcoin kind of make excuses for this or say, uh, well, you know, it's actually it, it's clean or it's there's some there there so, so there's ways that you can say that this is not too much of a problem, but it is actually a very very wasteful. Yes, and truth be told, the the biggest one is this incentivizes green power in the same way that a whole bunch of random shootings would incentivize bulletproof vests. Um, <laughs> you know, I think all technology creates energy consumption in certain patterns, and ultimately what we have to do is make sure that what we're building is something that's worthwhile and that we actually want in our society. But... Wait, it's worse. Okay. So the problem with the global public square is that it is a single limited entity and you have only so much you can add to it at any given time. Hmm. So Bitcoin burns 2% of the world's electricity or so to be able to process somewhere between three to seven transactions per second across the entire world. That's it. It's not many. It's not many. <laughs> and worse, it never could work for payments. So if we've seen come and go waves of companies say, we'll accept payment in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They're lying. <laughs> because they aren't actually accepting payment in Bitcoin. They are using a service that allows them to price in dollars presents Bitcoin to the customer, transfers the Bitcoin, turns it into dollars, and so the merchant is getting actual money. Mm. Bitcoin gives me payment options my customers appreciate. I accept Bitcoin with BitPay. Which means if the system has to balance and you want to buy with Bitcoin and you don't have Bitcoin, you have to convert dollars to Bitcoin. And this is, by design, a horribly expensive process because mm -hmm. Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies are fundamentally incompatible with modern finance. Mm -hmm. Modern finance has this rule that um, anything electronic needs to be reversible for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And this allows an undo in case of fraud. Have you had your credit card compromised before? I don't think I have, but I've had like holds put on stuff where they've asked, yeah. you know. I've had my credit card number stolen a couple of times, and mm -hmm. the amount of money I lost is zero. Mm. 
because we have both good fraud protection and good uh, ability to reverse. That does not exist in the cryptocurrency space. If uh, your uh, cryptocurrency wallet is compromised, all your apes are funged. And you're just simply out. All your, all your what? Sorry? All your apes are funged um, because the cryptocurrencies are often used for buying these non fungible tokens of pictures of ugly little apes and they just get liberated. <laughs> yes. The, the result is you cannot store cryptocurrency on an internet connected computer. Hmm. Because what will happen is if your computer ever gets compromised, all your money gets stolen. And there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. So what is it good for? Well, there are classes of payments that the intermediaries don't allow. And the big ones are drug dealing, uh, child sexual abuse material, and ransoms. And as a consequence, the cryptocurrency to actually use for payments Mm -hmm. is really only used seriously for ransomware payments, where companies have to pay $10 billion or $10 million. Uh, Drug deals online, where the drug dealers hate it, but it's the only game in town. And we've had cases of uh, websites selling child exploitation material paid with Bitcoin. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's why I've gotten so sour on the space is the ransomware. So how ransomware works is some bad guys in Russia break into, say, Colonial Pipeline. They Mm. encrypt all the data and say, hey, Colonial Pipeline, pay me five million bucks or your data is gone forever. And Colonial Pipeline pays the five million bucks and is offline for a while anyway. And there's gas disruptions on the East Coast. Mm. Um, And that exists only because there's the ransomware payment method of cryptocurrency. So it doesn't work for payments. And it doesn't work economically either. It's effectively a giant self-assembled Ponzi scheme. You hear about people making money in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. They only make money because some other sucker lost more. This is very different from the stock market. So I'm a savvy investor. By savvy investor, I put my money into index funds and ignore it for several years. Yes. Um, During that time... There are dividends and share buybacks where the companies put their profits into me. So I then eventually sell it to somebody else. And my gain is not just the difference between what I bought it for and what somebody else bought it for, but that plus the benefit of all the dividends and interest. So the stock market and the bond market is a positive sum game. So there are more winners than losers. Cryptocurrency starts with zero sum. So it starts with a world where there can be no more winning than losing. We have systems like this. It's called the horse track. It's called a casino. Mm. Cryptocurrency investing is really provably gambling in an Mm. economic sense. And then there's designs where those power bills have to get paid somewhere. So it becomes, instead of zero sum, deeply negative sum. Mm. And so effectively, the economic analogies are gambling and a Ponzi scheme mm-hmm. because the profits from the, er, that are given to the early investors are literally taken from the later investors. And this is why I call the space overall a self-assembled Ponzi scheme. There's been no intent to make a Ponzi scheme, but due to its nature, that is the only thing it can be. And so is that is that why you see you know the, the Super Bowl ads 
pile of Super Bowl ads for investing in cryptocurrency because the people who are the early investors need to keep finding new suckers and trying to convince people that putting their retirement savings into cryptocurrency is a sound idea. They calm their minds and steal their nerves with four simple words that have been whispered by the intrepid since the time of the Romans. Fortune favors the brave. Yep. And so uh, because it's a self-created pyramid scheme, you have to keep getting new suckers in. That as soon as the number of suckers dries up, it collapses. Hmm. And because it's not zero sum, but deeply negative sum, there's actually a lot of mechanisms that can cause it to collapse suddenly to zero. So we saw this just the other day with the Terra stablecoin and the Luna side token. Mm -hmm. So this was basically another Ponzi scheme implemented in the larger space of Ponzi schemes. So the idea is you had these two cryptocurrencies, Terra and Luna. Terra is supposed to be tied one-to-one -one with the dollar while Luna can float around. Mm -hmm. If Terra costs more than a dollar, you can turn Luna into Terra and make a profit. If Terra ever costs less than a dollar, you can turn Terra into Luna and make a profit. Hmm. But this only works as long as the value of Luna is greater than the value of Terra. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you use Terra at all? Well, one is... This is a stable coin, and these are necessary for the gambling aspects of cryptocurrency because mm. they act as basically casino chips because almost all of the cryptocurrency exchanges are really cut off from the banking system. Mm. But the other reason is because you could take your Terra stable coin, put it in a lending protocol that was created by the creators of Luna and Terra and get a 20% rate of return paid for by Luna and Terra, aka a Ponzi scheme. And so billions of dollars of notional value went into this Ponzi scheme and the backing the, of Luna just slowly crept down, 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 and then all of a sudden, there was a crisis of faith. Mm. There was a crisis of faith. People no longer believed that Terra was worth a dollar. It depegged to 95 cents. And then it collapsed amazingly quickly over the space of two to three days. And we're now at the point where the Terra stablecoin that was supposed to be, be worth one dollar mm. is now worth 10 cents. Mm. And the uh, Luna token has basically gone down by 99.99%. Mm. And uh, people keep finding out that just because something's gone down 95% doesn't mean it can't still go down another 95%. Mm. Okay. What about the uh, the other uh, major stable coin, this, the Tether? Um, is, that, uh, so is that subject to the same kinds of risks? Uh, yes and no. It is subject to the same kind of risks, but it's different. It doesn't have this algorithmic collapse model, but it does have the potential for bank runs causing collapse because it's unbacked. Tether is almost certainly what we'd call a wildcat bank. So back in the uh, 1800s, the government only issued coins. But coins are heavy, coins are bulky, coins are hard to deal with. So you take your coin to the local bank and they would give you a banknote, literally an IOU saying, if you mm. want a dollar gold coin, take this IOU back to the bank and you get this dollar gold coin. And so what happened is you got basically fraudulent banks spring up and they were called wildcat banks because they'd often have animal pictures on the banknotes. And so what they would do is they would take deposits and lend out the coin or actually just issue pieces of paper completely unbacked at all. 
And then when the state bank regulators would come along, because this was in the days when the banks were regulated by the state, the wildcat banks would like have barrels of coin that were fake, that all but the top layer was just junk with a top layer of gold coins on the top. Mm. And Tether is clearly doing the same thing because Mm. if Tether was backed by real money, this would mean that there is some $80 billion worth of money from institutional savvy investors that wanted to invest in the cryptocurrency space, but didn't want to just buy on Coinbase. So they had to go to this third party that has been caught lying about its reserves, run by who knows who. The the CEO is basically MIA, um, headquartered in the Bahamas, technically, and invest that way. And why would you do that? It's just... Hmm complete nonsense. So what's really almost certainly happening with Tether is Tether creates new Tether tokens, loans it to their big colleagues in the cryptocurrency space. So Alameda Research and a couple others like that. Alameda Research provides IOUs. So Tether says they're backed by loans then Alameda goes out and buys Bitcoin, driving up the price. And now the tether is backed by Bitcoin. The problem is, is when these houses of cards fail, they fail so catastrophically and so swiftly Mm. that things go from being worth a dollar to being worth nothing in the space of three days. I, I want to uh, zoom out again to the uh, talk about just cryptocurrency in general and go uh, back to some of the, so some of the uh, sort of broad critiques you have. Is it is it right to summarize what you were saying earlier as essentially there is no real problem that it solves, and to the extent that it is functional, it does things worse than we can already do them with normal electronic money through payment systems that exist already unless i think you were saying it does have advantages but the only advantage is in fact uh, is in fact crime and every other claim that is made for the superiority of cryptocurrency as currency sort of falls apart if you scrutinize it Yes. So let's take the cost of a transaction. Mm -hmm. The cost of a transaction in cryptocurrency systemically is the amount being used to protect it. I could build a system that would have the same throughput as Bitcoin, three to seven transactions per second, but with a centralized trusted entity. And not even a centralized trusted entity 10 trusted entities, only six of which need to be honest in the end. Hmm. Because I use a basically a majority vote type scheme. I name these 10 entities and I could do it on 10 computers that look like this. For for our listeners, he's holding up a a very tiny... uh, (laughs) I'm holding up a Raspberry Pi compute module. Okay. Um, This entire computer is like 50 bucks kind of thing. Okay. Um, So for 500 bucks worth of compute and as much power as an incandescent bulb, I could do the same functionality as Bitcoin just with 10 named entities. Why don't I do this? Because those 10 named entities would have to follow money laundering laws. And so apart from getting a structure where the named entities don't follow money laundering laws, there's no advantage for the cryptocurrencies despite burning nine orders of magnitude more power. Yeah, it's, it's really quite... St- that is one of the shocking, uh, the sort of jaw-dropping moments in, in your lecture when you reveal just just how wasteful this is compared to how you could do 
essentially the the same thing and you wouldn't have this really pathetic three to seven transfers per second all all around the world and you you note that it it, it kind of suggests that uh, Elon Musk who's touted uh, you know for electric cars that are going to be a, an important solution to climate change but who has invested billions of dollars of Tesla's money in Bitcoin probably isn't that that it kind of exposes him as not being that that serious or consistent about uh, about uh, reducing our our carbon emissions well uh, uh, phony Stark over there has uh, a walking talking dunning Kruger syndrome going um, and his investment in cryptocurrency is clearly one of those because like the other cryptocurrency that he often hypes is Dogecoin. Dogecoin was a literal joke invented in the early days of cryptocurrency um, about, hey, this stuff is so stupid. Let's make a coin about a meme of a talking dog. Uh, the Doge community, I think, has... Uh... Is somewhat irreverent, obviously, and uh, is uh, has great memes and loves dogs, and I, I love dogs and memes. And um, uh, it, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, and um, you know, I think the you know there's there's, there's a... the founder of Dogecoin says this is a joke. Avoid the cryptocurrency space. It is total garbage. Mm-hmm. Because this joke is now the tenth most valuable cryptocurrency. <laughs> but these claims that are that are made for it, I mean, about being, you know, well, you often hear things like, well, blockchain technology has a lot of potential applications, and it's really interesting, and there are lots of different possible solutions. But one of the things you point out is that. Uh, when people say things like this, often they they're really pretty vague, and they don't. And and usually, when you when you really boil down the the facts, there's a much simpler solution. Uh, I think <laughs> I think I think you used uh, the examples of uh, what, what is it vaccines in India. I forget what you. Yeah. You, so. So the thing is, is the idea behind a blockchain is actually a 30 plus year old idea. It's called a hash chain. And we've Mm. known how to build these for longer than most of my students have lived. People who spout blockchain don't understand the technology. So this was a concrete example that made me create my iron law of blockchain. Blockchain solves one problem. That problem is when somebody says you can solve X with blockchain, they don't understand X and you can ignore them. So So it's useful in that sense. (laughs) Yes, it is a useful filter. filter. So this was an example given by a purported expert in a blockchain class at Berkeley. Okay, we have the cold chain problem. So vaccines, you need to ship cold. And if they ever get out of temperature spec, you have a ruined batch. And this was an example in 2019. It's still relevant today for some reason. And we can solve this with blockchain. And my reaction is no. The problem is, is you need to know when it got out of spec And know that the uh, receiver can know that it had gotten out of spec. Mm -hmm. And there's an easy solution. It's called a $1 shock watch label. So the shock watch group makes these temperature labels that you stick them on the package. And Mm -hmm. if it ever got too warm, the color changes. No blockchain necessary. And that somebody was prepared porting this as a real world application said they had not even thought about the problem for five seconds. They had no familiarity with how cold chain works. They have no familiarity with how uh, the sensing process works. Mm. Um, We see it the same way when people talk about cryptocurrency uh, banking the unbanked and being a payment system. And if you take any of those people and you ask them what M-Pesa is, 
they will just look at you like uh, you're speaking Kenyan because, well, you are. So for those of you who aren't familiar, M-Pesa is a payment system that started in Kenya by Vodafone about the same time as Bitcoin and has eaten the third world. It's huge Hmm. um, because it just basically attaches a balance to your phone account and you can text to somebody else and transfer money that way. Hmm. And so even with the most basic dumb phone, you have easy to use electronic money. And this has taken over multiple countries as being a huge primary payment system. Mm. Well, the cryptocurrency doesn't work. So El Salvador. Oh, yes. <laughs> Bitcoin is legal tender in El Salvador, but you aren't actually using Bitcoin. Instead, they created a new wallet, the Shivo wallet. Mm. That's a electronic payment channel that takes Bitcoin and dollars and just updates your balance in a central database. It's not actually doing a transfer. Okay, I'm in Santa Ana, El Salvador, and I tried to use my my normal Bitcoin in the supermarket over here, um, and they had a thing that said Bitcoin accepted. When I got to the counter, they said it was only Bitcoin used by, I think, as I understand it, it was the El Salvador Bitcoin app. They wouldn't take my Coinomi app. So I've been here about, I don't know, about a week and a half or something. The one case where we've had a attempt to do a wide scale pay with Bitcoin system, El Salvador, mm-hmm. nobody actually uses it. They People just signed up and have since stopped using it. So mm-hmm. even when you have a central database and a central authority, cryptocurrencies don't work for payments because they bounce around in price. I think one of the things that you said, if I recall, is that uh, the cryptocurrency space is speed running 500 years of financial history, by by which I take it you mean that uh, all all of the kind of financial disasters of centuries past are sort of playing out uh, in you know <laughs> in, in, in short order, and then. You have to rediscover the solutions that were put in place in order for those things not to happen. So you start off thinking, oh, well, it would, wouldn't it be fantastic if there were no central authority? And then all of a sudden you realize uh, we need, we really, it would really be nice if we had a, uh, a central authority and you sort of rediscover the, the virtues of, of banks and government. <laughs> yeah, cryptocurrency, teaching libertarians about market failure since 2009. <laughs> um, the thing is, is the cryptocurrency space itself, though, has the object permanence of a horny mayfly. They just simply don't remember their own scams. So Ponzi schemes in the cryptocurrency space have existed since 2012, 2013. So back in those days, a huge amount of Bitcoin 10% of all Bitcoin at the time got invested into a Ponzi scheme. This Ponzi scheme was so big in the cryptocurrency space that the editor of the Bitcoin magazine bet $90,000 that he didn't have that it wasn't a Ponzi scheme. And so the investors in the Ponzi scheme were then taking the other side of that bet in order to... uh, protect themselves. And so when the Ponzi scheme inevitably failed, well, they were out their money and the bets didn't pay off because the editor of Bitcoin magazine didn't have the money. Mm. But it gets better. Guess what the name of the guy running the Ponzi scheme was? Pirate at 40. The 10% of all Bitcoin at the time got invested into a Ponzi scheme run by a guy calling himself Pirate at 40. Hmm. Really, the reason why I say half a millennia failure is at start, there's a huge amount of tulip mania. So back in 2018, we had a tulip mania of these deformed cats called Crypto Kitties that shut down Ethereum. 
And now we have a tulip mania of these deformed apes that lo- overloaded and shut down Ethereum. Um, because, of course, it can't really do all that much. The The thing is, is there's just no object permanence in the space. They just don't remember their old mistakes. And so they just keep making them over and over and over again. Yes, I, I, I suppose we have to talk about the apes because... I really, really don't get this. I really don't understand what people who pay large sums of money for... I don't even know how you can own a JPEG without owning the copyright to it. I don't know what you're, what you're buying, what is, what this is... I really don't understand the NFT thing, so... Perhaps you could tell me how this fits into the picture and, and, and what the best way to conceive of it as as a normal person. So most of the NFTs are as follows. A bunch of computer-generated variants are created. They're put up on a web page. I sell you a receipt to a URL that says you theoretically own this receipt. And that's it. You can trade this receipt to somebody else. By default, an NFT gives you no rights. It is literally just a receipt for your purchase that you can trade to somebody else. Can, can I that, just stop you? Can I, I, I want to break this down. I, I don't. What does it mean? What does own mean? You have a receipt that says, I am the owner of this URL. <laughs> But 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 what what does what does being the owner without having any rights mean? You can sell it that receipt to somebody else. <laughs> okay. Now uh, the apes are a little bit different. You have a license to make as many derivative works of the ape you own as long as hmm. you own it. And that is actually pretty unique. And so what ends up happening is the big market for the apes is people to make derivative apes. So uh-huh. you buy four or five ape NFTs, use that to create the base for 400 to 500 algorithmically derived alternate apes like caked apes or spaced apes or apes that eat their uh, slurp juice or, or whatever, uh-huh. um, to create more derivative apes um, that you then sell to more suckers. And, and, and is this is just like baseball cards, essentially? You have to convince people that there's some pleasure in owning these things or that they're going to go up in value? Uh, it's They're going to go up in value. That it's... The only non-part of that is the conspicuous consumption of, oh, I've got the Rolex. Uh, so <laughs> we've we've talked about a, a lot of different aspects of the what is called the cryptocurrency space. We've talked about the you know the inefficiency, the volatility, the way that irreversibility is uh, actual is touted as a feature, but is in fact. Uh, enables mm. fraud and ransom. We've talked about the environmental destruction. Um, uh, oh, yeah. One other thing I wanted to ask you is you said in your lecture that cryptocurrency enables venture capitalists to carry out securities fraud as a business model. And I wonder if you could explain what you meant by that. Okay. So... There's a lot of securities regulations out there. And the Mm -hmm. definition of security is very broad. It dates back to the Howey test in the the Great Depression era. Um, And that happens to be one of the most cleanest legal tests ever for, is this a investment contract? Therefore, a security that should be regulated by securities regulators. Mm Mm-hmm. It's very much a, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and swims like a duck and flies like a duck, it's a duck. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in the old days, 
like a few years ago, you're Anderson Horowitz. You invest in several companies. And these companies get to a point where either they implode and you lose your money, whoop de doo or uh, they get bought by a bigger company and you make a profit, or you go public, but in order to go public, you have to do a lot of paperwork. Basically, you have to do honest financial disclosures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's not how they work now. How they work now is basically uh, securities fraud by inducement. So they invest in a cryptocurrency related company. They strongly encourage that cryptocurrency company to issue a token that acts as a promise for some eventual service, like, say, dental care or a orange tree in Florida. And they sell that token to the venture capitalists at a huge discount. So the venture capitalists get a huge pile of these tokens. And then what happens is they have the uh, encourage the company to go and sell the token to the general public. And ideally, they uh, get that token listed on Coinbase, which is largely owned by Anderson Horowitz. And now the venture capital is able to sell their tokens to retail investors. This is blatantly an unlicensed security. This is blatant hmm. securities fraud. But they didn't commit the securities fraud. It was just the companies they invested in that did hmm. the securities fraud. And the SEC has not been proactively enforcing this. They only hmm. retroactively enforce against the initial coin offerings after they fail. So what ha will happen is Anderson Horowitz and company invested in a bunch of startups that all issued tokens that all got dumped on retail, including Anderson Horowitz dumping a lot of them on retail. And when things fail, the only people to prosecute are the companies, not Anderson Horowitz itself. So they've been able to make securities fraud a business in such a way that mm. they are legally remote so you'll not be able to throw them in jail. Well, what, what you said suggests that it, to some degree they're working with careful legal loopholes here, but there's also a there are ways in which regulators ought to be stepping up. You wrote an article with in Slate with uh, the security expert Bruce Schneier about. Um, the, the way that without banning cryptocurrency outright, we can deal with it in a sensible way uh, in terms of uh, regulation and law. So, so perhaps, you know, to, to conclude here, you could you could outline what you what you think is the necessary approach to mitigating the various harms that this is doing. So the first thing is is you don't, in many cases, need new laws. You just need existing laws to be enforced. So every initial coin offering, every single one of them checks every tick box of the Howey test. The SEC has the authority to stop those proactively rather than reactively. Um, they choose not to. Most of these decentralized organizations are not actually decentralized. They are identifiable entities. So when you have regulations that apply to identified entities, like say money transmission laws, apply them to the named entities in these decentralized cases. The cryptocurrencies themselves are actually largely non-fungible, that uh, cryptocurrency is pseudonymous, not anonymous. So actually enforce um, requirements on transfers to make sure that money that's been contaminated by bad stuff is not allowed. 
So like that would disrupt a whole bunch of bad activity. And it's not a case of new laws, but a case of existing laws. And the big one is, is to put it bluntly, the SEC needs to grow a pair. <laughs> because yeah. this space is provably zero negative sum. So it's provably can only harm investors. Mm. Everything in this space, for the most part, ticks stuff that the SEC is allowed to regulate, which it can regulate, which it should regulate. Mm. And basically, there's a fear among regulators that I think started in the 80s of being accused of stifling innovation. Mm. There is no innovation to stifle, so regulate away. Mm. Because the problem is with the current regulation model is they're doing a let's pick up the pieces afterwards. So after the things fall apart, we're going to go and pick up the pieces rather than, hey, let's stop things from falling apart in the first place, which mm. would save billions of dollars of investor money. What is the future of a cryptocurrency in the absence of changes in the uh, in existing regulations? Is it is it is it doomed inherently through internal through features internal to it? Where where is where is this going uh, if allowed to just follow its own logic? It will implode spectacularly. The only question is when. Um, I thought it would have actually imploded uh, a year ago. But basically, the what we saw with Terra and Luna, where it collapsed completely suddenly due to these uh, downward positive feedback loops. So situations where basically the system is designed to collapse utterly and quickly. Um, those will happen to the larger cryptocurrency space. Mm. Because, for example, the mining process is horribly expensive. We're talking 1% to 2% of the world's electricity consumption. Mm. Most of that has not been paid for. So the mining companies, for the most part, have been taking the cryptocurrency and borrowing against the cryptocurrency that they create, rather than sell it because the market's actually very thin. Um, this means there's a huge amount that is subject to potentially catastrophic margin calls. And so that creates a feedback loop where the price drops a little, somebody's forced to sell, that drops the price more, they're forced to sell more, and this creates a feedback loop that drives the price into the ground catastrophically. Now... The thing is, the previous times this has happened, because we had the bubble at 100, powered by fraud at Mt. Gox, and that imploded down to 10. We had a bubble at 1,000, powered by fraud. It imploded and went back down to 100. We had a bubble to 10,000, powered by Tether, as a fraud. It blew up and went back down to 1,000. And now we're at a bubble where Bitcoin is blowing, blew up to 60,000 again, fueled by Tether and falling. But I don't think there'll be a fifth bubble because basically they will have broken all the suckers left to break. That there's only so many more suckers that can be brought into that space. And... Once you burn out a sucker, they don't come back. They're a non-renewable resource. So in mining out the suckers, they're going to end up running out of greater fools. So I suspect that the cryptocurrency space will go fine, absent regulation, until one day it goes and collapses greatly. Mm. Yeah, what you say about the continuation of finding suckers is, I think, I think the last thing I would just like to end on here is, um, I was in New York City recently. I was on the subway and there, uh, and then I looked around me at the ads, and they were all ex for uh, crypto, 
you know, there was some 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 new I don't even know what it fucking was, but it was it was some kind of crypto thing that they were encouraging people to put their money in and saying that it was a safe investment. And uh, you know, just and of course I, I mentioned the Super Bowl ads earlier. And I think the 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 thing that it might be worth emphasizing is when we say the suckers, we're, we're talking about people who are taken advantage of, right? When you talk about the, the ransomware, um, when you talk about fraud, uh, when you talk about child exploitation material, when you talk about uh, people who put their savings into these things, um, we're talking about, separate from the environmental destruction, a, a lot of like human pain that comes yep. from, from, that is inflicted upon people by, by this, that is enabled uh, by the proliferation of this. Yes. And that's, that's the problem that, and that's why I've actually changed my view over the past decade. Um, back in 2013, I thought it was amusing and silly and I could get cool papers out of it. In 2018, I thought it was amusing, but pretty bad. It's time to really think about burning it down. And now I just want to take the entire cryptocurrency space and throw it into the sun. And I know astronomers will tell you it's easier to throw something into the void of space than it is into the sun, but it's worth the extra energy to make sure some alien doesn't find this mental virus. Oh. Yeah, well, good luck. You're, you're battling uh, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, who, who both showed up at the crypto car- conference recently. And I bet they got paid in actual money. <laughs> just like, like no, no bitcoin please <laughs> no uh that actually happened so like the the washington nationals just the other day started doing a lot of tweets for their uh business relationship with tara mm. that was five million dollars for five years prepaid in advance in cash so for the next five years, the Washington Nationals are obliged to hype a cryptocurrency that failed spectacularly already. <laughs> but they got their money. so right? They got their money. They just have to hype it now for uh, five years. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, pr- Professor uh, Weaver, thank you so, so much for joining me and uh, explaining this, uh, this so clearly. Uh, there's a there's so much bullshit to to wade through, and there are so few people who are talking about this in a uh, you know in a really intelligent uh, way. And I, I really appreciate your work, and uh, good luck with your your mission to uh, uh, throw it into the flames. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I've seen some tweets going around, some things people are saying. Man, I lost literally everything, 100% of my life savings, thinking about killing myself. Over time, that lesson will take you much farther than any success would have. Because this, if you allow it to, will shape the way you approach the future, looking at life as a series of asymmetric bets.